Some of you may have noticed that the gospel was not read from the book it usually is proclaimed from. It was read from just a much smaller Bible, one that put my glasses to the test. That is because on this, the second Sunday of Christmas, even though it's a Sunday that we only get to celebrate, gosh, not even half of the time because of how Christmas Day falls in the week, there are three uh, possible Gospels uh, for the preacher to, to choose from. And the one I chose from Matthew uh, omits three verses in the, the middle, in the center of it, uh, those verses about Herod slaughtering the holy innocents. And I wanted to make sure you heard them this day, since not everyone was in church on Monday to celebrate that feast. Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. So ends Matthew's version of the Christmas story. The Savior, newly born, it seems, needs to be saved. And what does God do? God turns to humanity, specifically to Joseph. With the incarnation, God not only becomes human, but God entrusts, entrusts God's self to the care of humanity you and me. Everything about Matthew's Christmas story has the harsh reality of today's headlines. An unwed mother, a tyrant ruler, refugees, violence, death. Matthew offers no cause for Christmas sentimentality. There are no angel choirs and heavenly lights, no shepherds, no manger where the little Lord Jesus lays down his sweet head. No, according to Matthew, Mary is pregnant, unmarried but betrothed to Joseph. Joseph has a dream and an angel tells him to take Mary as his wife. He obeys, the child is born, he's named Jesus. The wise men have visited and returned to their own country. And now King Herod, who really was a horrible man, King Herod is royally ticked off, infuriated that he has been tricked by the wise men. Fearful of this newborn king of the Jews, he murders all the baby boys who were two years old or under. If you think that was bad, he killed several of his own children, and it was said that it was actually safer to be one of his pigs than one of his offspring. And now, as a result of Herod's proclamation, the Holy Family, now the Holy Refugees, flee to Egypt. Matthew's Christmas story is set in a world of violence, filled with power, Fear, death, oppression, wailing, and loud lamentation. One in which innocence is slaughtered, and survival means life on the run. And yet, and yet there is something reassuring and comforting about this setting. For if that is not the world into which, into which the Savior is born, then I ask you, of what relevance is he to you and me and our world, to our lives? The headlines of our day are not that different from the headlines of Jesus' day, violence and death, weeping tyrants. At a more personal level, each one of us could probably name the Herods of our lives and tell a story of fear, oppression, violence, death, running for our life, the loss of innocence, sorrow, weeping. This is our world. And it is into our world that Jesus is born. It is into this world, our world, that Jesus comes and saves his people. 
It is this world, our world, in which Jesus will reveal that God is truly with us. It's not enough, however, for us to simply celebrate that, to celebrate Christmas as the birth of the Savior, and then get back to life as usual, as if Christmas is somehow over. If we stand at the manger adoring the newborn Savior only to walk away and celebrate the new year, pay the Christmas credit card bills, return to work and school, begin work on our taxes, well then, I assure you, we will read the same old headlines over and over and over again. Whether we call it Herod, Archelaus, fear, poverty, war, hunger, injustice, violence, addiction, despair, sorrow, death, indifference, or any one of a thousand other names, there is always a tyrant seeking to destroy the divine life tyrant that wants to kill the holiness in this world, a tyrant that proclaims itself as ruler and denies that God is with us. The salvation Christ brings is not simply an exhibition of what God can do, and that means we cannot just stand by as spectators waiting and watching. No, we are called to participate and cooperate with God in our own salvation by our faithfulness, in our life of prayer, by listening, obedience. We cooperate with God's salvation through acts of compassion, caring for the poor, speaking for justice on behalf of those who have no voice, offering mercy forgiveness. We participate in our own salvation each time we repent and seek reconciliation with God and our neighbor. Sometimes it means we live in hope when everything around us makes us want to despair. God entrusted the divine life of his son to Joseph. That is what Joseph's dreams are all about, taking Mary as his wife, fleeing to Egypt, returning to the land of Israel, going away to the district of Galilee. Every one of his dreams is about protecting the holy from the Herods of this world. Whether he knew it or not, in taking the child and his mother and fleeing to Egypt, Joseph was participating in his own salvation. Each and every one of us has been entrusted with divine life. That is the truth, the reality of Christmas. We find it wherever we go. It is in our families, our marriages, our work, the strangers we encounter, the enemies we avoid, the oppressed and marginalized. Divine life, the presence of God, is everywhere waiting for us. That divine life, like a young child, needs to be cared for nurtured, loved, protected, and fed in order that it might grow into its intended fullness. That is our Christmas work. So as this Christmas season comes to an end, and decorations are packed away, the lights taken down, the leftovers thrown out, and life returns to normal, I wonder, I wonder how will we care for the gift of holiness? How will we care for the gift of God's presence in the world, in each other, in ourselves?